Unlocked is brought to you by Invincible, a program designed to unlock the potential of people and teams inside your organization. Join companies like Pfizer, Delta, the CDC, Google, and Chick-fil-A and others in over 116 countries that are currently using this program to increase productivity and develop healthy cultures. Access hundreds of hours of content that is accessible anytime, anywhere. And finally, use real-time data to understand the health of every team inside your organization, which teams are performing and which ones aren't. Then understand the why behind that performance. Get free access to Invincible for 30 days by visiting www.giant.tv slash 30 days. Welcome to another episode of Unlocked. I am Scott and today I have something for you. And his name is Steve Hoffman. Um, Captain Hoff, as they call him in Silicon Valley, is a serial entrepreneur. And he is the CEO and co-founder of Founders Space, which specializes in saving entrepreneurs from making critical mistakes and building their businesses and, and eventually possibly losing them. Um, everybody needs uh, help, uh, uh, someone to help them, coach them. And Steve is that person. Um, he is full of energy. You're gonna see that in this video. It is so fun uh, interviewing Steven. He, he has a lot of energy, a lot of knowledge that he brings to the table. We talk a lot about just the idea of a startup and what go is involved in that, but also obviously the sprinkling of the people aspect of leaders and leading a startup and what not to do. Hmm? I think we need to, to be aware of that. Uh, things that we should be doing, obviously, and replace of those things that we shouldn't be doing. And what can lead us to be a more successful startup? He is the author of several best-selling books. Make Elephants Fly was one of them. He has a new one called Surviving a Startup that he's about to launch. And he's got an awesome, awesome promo for you at the end of the video. So make sure you pay attention to that. And also I'll put a link in the show notes. So let's get on with this interview with Stephen Hoffman. Hello, Steve Hoffman, AKA Captain Hoff. We are super excited to have you. Um, and, uh, you got a new book coming out. We're going to talk about that and some other things. So how's it, th how's it going over there? I am super duper excited to be here. <laughs> you just one, one up to my super excited. Steve. I could go more super duper <laughs> expialidocious. <laughs> I'll bet you could. I'll bet you could. Uh, we've had a great conversation leading up to this. And uh, I'm, I am excited to have you on here. I think you have a wealth of knowledge. Um, you've got, a, got a, some exciting stuff coming out in the future here. Uh, and right now you've got the book coming out and this isn't your first book, uh, but you are strongly, strongly, strongly en entrenched in the startup space. Um, where did that come from? That passion for startups and why do you keep doing it? You know, I ask myself that question every day because <laughs> it's not easy doing a startup and I am a serial entrepreneur. And even now that I you know, coach startups, fund startups, run Founder Space, which is a global startup incubator and accelerator. It's still a startup, right? I'm still running this crazy business. Um, only I'm doing it in partnership with hundreds of entrepreneurs around the world. I will tell you why. Because I am somebody who loves new ideas. I love interacting with people who are inventing, making things like in, you know, out there uh, with visions of the world, how to shape the world. And that's what gets me so excited. So every day I get up, I'm like, uh, what entrepreneur can I talk to? What, you know, because they're going to show me amazing things that I would have never thought of. And then if I can help them a little along the way, that makes me feel great. I, I call those people the little fish with big dreams right? The, they're these people that are going out on a limb. They've, they've, you know, taken out their 401k. They've, you know, saved up. They're just ready to roll. They've got this big idea and they just want to make an impact on the world. And that is energizing for sure. And totally it's, 
Uh, it's very energizing. It's also, you know, an emotional roller coaster ride for the person who's on it because I've been on it many times. I did two bootstrap startups where I did funded everything myself, three venture funded startups. You know, I was in the trenches. I went through highs and lows and, you know, there, there are times there where you've really, as an entrepreneur, in order to succeed, you have to risk everything. You have to risk your relationships with your family and friends because you're working all the time. Even a marriage potentially is on the line. You have to risk potentially your life savings, all the money you've saved up. And, and then uh, you have to go out into the world and it's all on you to make it happen. And so that's a lot of pressure and people deal with it in different ways. So I see part of my job is not just handing them money um, and not just giving them uh, knowledge that they can use for their business, but also helping them uh, inside with their, their, their struggles that all of us have to overcome to actually do take on a big challenge. Yeah, because the stuff you said at the beginning sounds really scary. Like, why would I want to do that? You know, like, why don't I just go get a corporate gig somewhere where they can pay my 401k and my job, my healthcare and all this other stuff. And I don't have to take all those risks of my family and it's a nine to five, whatever. Right. So not that we live in a nine to five world anymore, but you, you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, that's, that's pretty risky. Now with, with that being said, you help these entrepreneurs, you help these, these startup dreamers come up with a lot of things. You give them a lot of tools, a lot of resources, enabling them to be who they want to be and do what they want to do. I want to talk a little bit about your new book and also the, the angle of people and why um, and how to manage people in a way that helps us all succeed, right? When we're doing a startup um, and also the critical mistakes that startups make when involving their people. It, is that something you touch on in your book? Absolutely. So in Surviving a Startup, I go really in-depth on different management techniques because I get a, the book is based on my personal experiences and all the experiences of the entrepreneurs I work with and the questions they ask me. Like, the, you know, the really the pressing questions that will kind of determine their fate. And one thing I've learned when doing a startup is that most entrepreneurs in the beginning spend far too much time obsessing over their idea. Is this the next big idea, you know, that will change the world? And I'm like, don't think of that because whatever idea you have in your head, it's fictional. Like you imagine that. You won't know if that idea works until you actually take it out into the real world. And what you'll discover along the way is that you're gonna have to change that idea. You may have to change it a little if you're lucky, but most entrepreneurs change it completely because they get, start getting feedback from the real world of what's at, what the world actually needs, what reality actually is. And then they, they have to adapt their vision to that. So I say, don't waste, like, don't, first of all, don't let not having a big idea stop you from being an entrepreneur. Um, because a lot of the best ideas were things people stumbled upon. Like, they didn't even know that it was the big idea. You look at Google, right? So Google, the founders of Google thought they were doing a nonprofit, yet it is one of the most profitable companies in the world because they were making a tool for academic re uh, academics to, to find research papers online. That's a small idea, right? YouTube, they thought they were doing a video dating site. Now look at YouTube, right? The, the kind of the de facto user generated broadcast network, you know, out there. Um, each of these, so when you're starting out, don't, don't spend a lot of time on your idea. And honestly, don't spend a lot of time building product. You know, that is a mistake because your idea is probably wrong. So what you're building is probably not the right thing. Um, what I tell them to do, to get back to your point, is focus on the people. The, the startups that I succeed, the, the, the founder of the startup, the CEO, the, their top priority and where they put 80% of their time in the beginning is finding the right people that they, that complement their skills. So all of us are good in certain things. And some people like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk seem to be able to do everything, right? But that isn't most of us. And even those that do everything, they, can't, they don't have time to do everything, right? You're like, even if you're good at a lot of different things, at the end of the day, your job is to be CEO. And the number one job of a startup CEO is to bring in talent. Because if you bring in the right people, 
and you put them, give them a direction to go. It doesn't have to be a specific idea. It can be just like, we want you to innovate in this area, right? We think this is going to be a, the blockchain is going to be a big thing or AI is going to be a big thing. And we want you to innovate in that and food and agriculture. Then these people will actually be the ones who have the time and focus to actually build and figure out what will make your company successful. But if you don't have those people on, and I see solopreneurs all the time, solo entrepreneurs, they almost always fail because they haven't surrounded themselves with the talent they need to actually build a business. One person never builds a business. No matter, Elon Musk by himself is not getting us to Mars, right? <laughs> he is getting us to Mars on the backs of thousands and thousands of incredibly talented people. So that is my first rule. Uh, when doing a startup and be selective. Don't get the people you necessarily can get. Like a lot of us say, oh, I happen to know this free programmer. They're not ideal, but I'll bring them on the team because that's the only program, uh, the only coder I know, or I know this designer. They're not the greatest in the world, but you know, they, they, they'll do it for free <laughs> or they'll do it for equity. Don't do that. Then just, you have to say, if they aren't like super talented, if I can't work with them in a really collaborative fashion, then don't bring them on your team and don't start charging ahead, trying to raise money, trying to build a product, trying to do all these other things, reach customers. No, find your people first. So smart. I think we all, we, we have a, a, almost a little bit of a scarcity mentality, right? And started these, these things up and we're like, well, how am I going to pay for that? And how am I going to pay for that? I'm just going to do it all myself. And you know, this whole mentality kicks in, which can be a really, a real big problem. Then we start, we bring people on and then we have some kind of loose agreement or maybe it is equity or maybe it is a cousin of a neighbor or something like that. Right. And we kind of build these relationships and, and then communication things start kicking in. And then they leave and then they, we have turnover and then we're burning time and money and all these efforts and trying to organize what's going on. And so that, that causes a real problem. But you mentioned something interesting I read about avoiding telling people what to do. So you're bringing people on, right? My first instinct is to say, well, if you don't tell them what to do, how do they understand what they're supposed to do? And how do you set expectations? Like, how does that all work within the dynamics of a company culture and a startup culture? Okay, so first of all, I wanna address your first piece. And you, I can see you've done this before. Like <laughs> you, you just described- A couple of times, every, I've only done that a couple of times. But yeah. What every entrepreneur, you know, who's trying to kind of do it alone and do it on a budget, you know, almost invariably goes to at the beginning. And there are a lot of pitfalls for that. You're asking me, like, there are a lot of mistakes entrepreneurs make. And you just pointed out one of the biggest ones. And, and that is trying to do it all yourself and also um, bringing on the people too late. Because what happens is the more you put into your company alone, the more you feel like they're not really the owner of it. You have su suffered. You have suffered for six months or a year on this project. You have invested a lot of time and money. And now they're just hopping on. You can't make them an equal partner. You, can't even, you don't even want to give them a lot of equity because it's not their idea. They didn't start it. And you know, they feel the same way. Like, it's not really my idea. Why should I work for free? <laughs> so you get this, this thing where you're kind of you know, loose connection, you're paying them a little money, giving them a little equity, but it's not enough to, you're not really making them your partner at the beginning. And so I, that's why I tell people, don't even wed yourself to an idea because the idea uh, should be all of your idea. Like when you find the right people, all of you should come together because I will tell you what binds people to your company, what keeps them like motivated and passionate is that they feel it's their company too. They're not just you know, on do, working for your success. They are, they are work, they own it. They're working for their own success. And when you engage them, if you can spend more time at the beginning, find the right people, give them substantial ownership, and then together iterate on a plan and ideas in the space to make it successful, suddenly you bond and you become this super unit. And this is what you see 
uh, amongst great early stage startups where they have an incredibly talented team and they all feel they own it and they will all do anything to make it succeed. So it's not one person trying to keep other people on board and they're dropping off and uh, nothing, you know, if that, as soon as you're in that position, I actually tell entrepreneurs, scrap it, start over. Like you're doing it the wrong way. You're going down the wrong path. You're not gonna build a big company that way, most likely, like unless you get super lucky. And then your other question was, you know, how do you manage people without telling them everything they should do? Because think about it, you want a really innovative nucleus of, in your first team. Your team, your rich core team is the one that is supposed to break through with an idea that changes everything in your sector, in your industry. That's not easy to do. Let's face it, if it was easy to do, everybody would do it. Everybody would be, you know, uh, the next Jack Dorsey or, you know, Elon Musk. We would all do it. It's really, really hard to do. To innovate is really hard to do. So what you need to do is, here's my rule for innovators and how to manage them. When you bring your team on, it's tempting because you kind of started the thing and you're the boss, technically you're the CEO, to come in and say, you do this, you do that. No, 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 don't do it that way, do it this way. But the more you do that, the more uh, they stop thinking for themselves and wait for you to tell them what to do. If they are waiting for you to tell them what to do, they're turning off their own brains. And all the responsibility now to come up with the, the plan of action, what to do next, how to do it is on you. That sucks your time away. It also is one brain as opposed to maybe two, three, four or five brains, you know, uh, ideating on this together, which is much exponentially more powerful. So what I have, my golden rule is ask, don't tell. It's the best form of management. And I don't care if you're a startup, a small startup, or in a big organization, you know, a big company, if you want your employees to own it and innovate, don't tell them what to do every day. When you walk into the, you know, your office or you're on a Zoom call with them, instead of just make a rule, I'm not going to tell anybody to do anything for the next two weeks. Try it, you know, to everybody you work with. Instead, you can get better results by asking them. So as soon as you meet them, Okay, how's the project going? Uh, what are you working on? Uh, what are the next steps? And then if you don't agree with a decision they're making, uh, why did you decide to do that? By asking them why, first of all, you're getting them to think, like self-reflect, like why did I decide to do that? You know, and you're learning from them what their thought process is. Maybe they had an idea that was better than yours. Like you think you know it all, but they might've come up with a way of doing it that initially sounds not right because you've never done it that way, but it's actually going to yield better results. And then you could say, uh, uh, what proof do you have uh, that that will work? How do you know that will work? And so you don't have to say no to them. Don't do that. You just question them deeply. And then you could say, you know, uh, is it possible to do more research in this area before we make that decision to make sure, is there a way to run a small test? So we can get some data back before we invest the next month in building this out. You didn't say no, you're not, they still own it. And when they are pushing for it, when they own it, uh, they uh, become so much more passionate, right? Because they need to prove to you. If they say, this is going to work, trust me, I know you've done it this way for the past 20 years, but if we, we use this new technology and use this new platform and do it this way, it's going to be so much better. And you're like, then it's on them to show you you're not forced, you don't have to force them to say, I want the best ever, right? The most innovative ever, you know, they're going to want to prove it to you and prove it to their peers. And if, and they'll, and they'll keep innovating until they come up with something that, that is what you want in a startup. And it's what you want in any innovation organization. And that goes back to what you said before about finding the right people that feel ownership. So how are you supposed to help them feel ownership if you're dictating all the time, right? If, if they're not allowed to think for themselves, right? So being inquisitive, not to the point that you're, you know, putting them in an interrogation chamber, but, you know, that you're allowing them to think and process and evaluate their next steps of why am I doing this and what's our next steps and gives them ownership, gives them responsibility, gives them both the task delegation, but also the authority 
right? To, to feel empowered in that position. And that's, what's fantastic is to, and, and we, and I always call it giving them enough support and enough challenge to help them feel liberated. Cause there's a lot of leaders out there that offer a ton of support all day. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I'm here for you, but they never hold them accountable. Right. Yes. Then they get yes. frustrated that nothing's ever getting done. <laughs> or you have the other leader that just dominates. It's just challenge, challenge, challenge all the time. When's it's going to be done? When's it's going to be done? When's it's going to be done, but offers no support. And then they don't feel any trust. And so there's, there's this thing that pulls right there. And so what you're talking about is empowering these individuals through, Hey, you've got the tools and the resources, but why are we doing this? Why are we, can we push this further? Can we, can we, do some more research. Can we understand why, what the next steps are? So is that what you're saying? I am saying exactly that. And you're also, in addition to everything you said, creating a culture of, of, inf- of questioning, right? Of, of interest in the other people. When you ask somebody something, you're interested in them. And you, you get, you, you creating a, a dialogue between you where you're listening to them simply by forcing yourself to ask questions and not tell, you start listening. You are sucking up information. You know, the really amazing uh, innovation CEOs out there, they'll walk around their company and they will constantly be asking all the people, all their key people they meet questions, right? Because they want to know. The questions get them to think, right? Get them information and insight into what's happening in their organization. And then they also force the other people to be really on the ball because they know every time the CEO is coming, they're asking questions. In addition, you, you set an example. Your management style uh, becomes an example for them in how they should manage their teams. If you're just telling them what to do, they're going to be telling their teams what to do. You know, it goes down the line. So, it's very important in innovation organizations of which startups are and big companies should be, right? The really great companies like Amazon are um, to, to, uh, to start at the very beginning with this. You know, it's not a top-down structure. It's a structure where if you're truly, like you said, going to support your employees, you need to understand what they're doing and what their problems really are. You need to... Uh, give them guidance, but in a way that gets them to think for themselves and act independently. If you're asking them questions, they implicitly understand that you're looking to them to take the initiative, right? You're not uh, forcing them to do it. You're like waiting for them to tell you, you know, when is this going to be done? What, how can we speed up the process? What, what more can we add to this? These, it's a great way to manage teams. And this also creates more cohesion in teams, right? They can create more unity in that team and that idea and the camaraderie that's happening. So creating a, co- a culture of cohesion is, is really interesting too. And you brought up trust, which was a really important thing. You know, trust is the, if you trust somebody, you can say, speak your mind. If you don't trust them, you're always going to be guarded, right? <laughs> that you're going to slip up. And then you, you don't speak your mind and the truth doesn't get out there and problems go unaddressed and people try to cover up. That is not what we want in any organization. So um, one thing is if you ask somebody questions and aren't yelling at them or telling them they made mistakes, but probing to find out why something happened, you in its essence are saying you trust them. You wouldn't ask somebody to give you the answers who you didn't trust. And they feel that trust. And they also, you, you don't want these meetings where people are ganging up against each other or somebody's saying, no, I think we should do it this way. No, I think we should do it this way. You know, those aren't productive meetings where you're all on the team together asking questions. How can we all make this better? Not what, you know, my idea is better than your idea. It's like, we just want to focus on what needs to be done. We don't want to focus on, you know, who, you know, who gets credit for this. That isn't the type of environment you want in, in your startup or in your big company. It doesn't matter. And when we are talking about this individual starting up, and you're talking about the mentality of, of this entrepreneur, right? This person has this big idea. They're starting to take the risk. They're going out on a, on a limb, taking out investing capital, possibly breaking relationships and destroying their, their lives potentially, right? To, to, to live out this dream, to do something they believe in. Um, there's, there's a tendency to want a lot of control, right? And that's, that's where this dictating every single little bit comes in, right? But they, 
they tend to want control. And you say it's not about control, it's about results. Yes. Now, this is a big thing. A lot of times when you're beginning a company, it's your money at stake, right? You put in your own money, you put your own reputation on the line, you are risking so much <laughs> to, uh, to make this company go uh, that you feel like you have to, it, it's spinning out of control. And every because startups on in the early stages are always out of control. They're like, a, they're out of, you know, and they're very, they're like could careen off the cliff anytime, you know, it doesn't take a lot for a startup to just tank. Um, this is why over 95% of startups fail. And, you know, I call my book surviving a startup because it is really a survival game, you know, 95% fail. But even of the 5% that succeed, only you know, a fraction of those become the big companies we're all talking about, the unicorns. So it's a small fraction of all the, the, the startups out there. And I, so uh, what I tell people is you are going to be um, taking big risks. You have to accept this and you have to know yourself. Like going into a startup, uh, you will have to, it's like a marathon that you have to train for. It isn't something you can just jump in from like a day job to a start. Now, certain people are natural entrepreneurs. They are risk tolerant. They have a very high tolerance for risk. They have a high tolerance for stress. They thrive on it. It just doesn't affect them. You know, other people freak out, you know, they <laughs> like, this is too much for me. So it's very important when you're going into it to Put yourself in a frame of mind that you cannot control everything. There is so much in a startup that is out of your control. The economy could change overnight. Uh, you're one of your key engineers that, your that holds the keys to your entire platform could become ill and literally drop out. You know, somebody, uh, there, could, uh, there can be a fight. There can be a million things that end up kind of uh, hampering you. So one of the tactics that I use is don't try to control it. Uh, you know, you really have to just accept what happens calmly and then work with your team, not against them to solve it. You have to sh point it out and say, how guys, how can we get over this hurdle? Like we're, you know, uh, we're, we only have this much cash left, you know, instead of hiding how little cash you have or worrying about it or trying to control what they spend, let them know this is how much cash left. And you know, it's going to be a while before we see any revenue. Like, so what can we do to make this go further, you know, and have them come to you with some sort of plan for how you're going to spend that money. Then they start to think, think of your cash as their cash, you know, or the investor's cash as their cash, you know, which is really what you want. You don't want to police them. You want them to police themselves and they'll do a much better job and feel better about it. Because when they tell themselves, no, I don't really need that expensive computer that they might have wanted to buy because it wasn't their money, you know, <laughs> the latest computer, when they tell themselves they don't need it, they feel much better than you telling them, no, you can't have it, you know? And they were like, oh, I really wanted that computer, <laughs> you know, with the latest processor. You're telling me I have to get a two-year-old computer for the time being? You know, uh, this, uh, that's the kind of environment and the psychology that really works. So smart. Uh, I think there's a lot that we can unpack in all of this. Um, you have so your new books launching. You've got a promo that you wanted to announce to all the listeners, everybody watching this. What, what is that promo? So I have a special promotion. The book uh, is being published by HarperCollins. It just went on sale on Amazon and all the online stores. It'll be in bookstores soon. If you pre-order the book now, you can get our complete online startup program, which is, uh, which is a series of, if you like this talk, it's, it's a whole online series where I'm giving really detailed advice. You can get the complete online startup program free for two years, which is a uh, cost more than the book itself. But we're doing that uh, for this, uh, you know, for, for your audience at this special time. So just go to founderspace.com, founderspace.com with two S's, and then slash promo, and you can find out all about it. Wow, that is awesome. I know what it's like to generate a ton of content, and then for you to do that and then give it away as a, as a add-on benefit of the book is amazing. That's really, really I cool. Love, 
I personally love working with and helping entrepreneurs. So it's like, I'm doing what, I mean, I think you could tell I'm a passionate guy. So I've always- No, that, followed, but it actually sounds like you just want to go get a day job. So ah! that's, <laughs> that's the last thing I want. I've done this, you know, my whole life and I, I can't go back. But I, I, love, uh, I love working with entrepreneurs. So um, also reach out to me. You can find me um, on every social network if you search for Founder Space. I'm even now on Clubhouse if you search for Founder Space and follow me. And I love to engage. So I'm always doing talks and communication and other stuff. Uh, let's go there and you can message me like on Instagram or whatever and we can communicate. Fantastic. Steven, thank you so much. Um, you have been a value add, I think, for my audience. And uh, I really appreciate the, the words of wisdom. Well, I love your podcast. I love your style and your also your enthusiasm. I think we share that. And I look forward to coming back in the future and talking more. Woo wee, I am on fire after that. Did you hear the energy from that guy? Um, so exciting. And what you didn't hear is that he is going to be leaving San Francisco and going out on the road. He spends a ton of time out on the road and internationally visiting incubators and startup communities and speaking and working with those communities. So he's going to be doing that here in the future. So keep track of Steven. See if you can interact with them in your city. If you're in the startup world, connect with this guy. Okay. Just connect with them. There's some powerful words of advice in here. Um, ask, don't tell, ask those questions help people feel invested and involved in the company. You want people that believe what you believe, but you also want to help foster growth and energy and helping them invest in you. And how are they gonna to wanna to invest in you is by feeling invested in the things that they're doing. And how do they feel that way is by you empowering them, you enabling that growth and investment to happen. So as a leader, be mindful of that and um, bring in good talent. Okay. We know that we're all scrapping. Okay. As an entrepreneur, I was an, on, I am an entrepreneur, right? We, we, we have this scrappy mentality and what's important is that yes, we understand that there's costs and there's risk and there's other things, but don't cheap out on certain aspects, especially the people, the people need to be important and they need to be talented and growth minded in order to get you to where you need to be, which is exploding, not sinking. So thank you, Stephen, for doing this show with us. And I really appreciate you and the knowledge. Good luck with the book. If anybody else out there wants to find out more about my show, you can go to scottwaldron.com, go to YouTube, search me there, like, subscribe, and comment in that area. Share with everybody you know. I would love to get more of this out there to other individuals that need it. So thank you again. I will see you next time on Unlocked.